Lord Jesus, God, we thank you for the privilege to be here in your house this morning. God, I pray for this uh, service this morning. God, I pray your will. God, I pray your anointing over each and every single person watching this morning. God, we welcome you into our homes this morning. God, we welcome you in this place this morning. Lord Jesus, God, I pray that you have your way. God, I pray that we let go and let you do what you want to do in our lives this morning, Lord Jesus. God, God we're open vessels. God, we want to be refilled and recharged. Lord Jesus, God, in your name we pray. In Jesus' name, have your way this morning. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah.
and yesterday's gone. Today I'm beneath Holy Ghost power. Breathe on me. has for you. Amen. You may be seated if you're standing at home. Pastor Mason, if you can come this morning. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here worshiping with all of you from Calvary Pentecostal Tabernacle. Those of you that are joining as part of the CPT family and the extended family, even around the world. We're finding that people are listening in by various means and we're happy to have you and may God bless you today. In the book of Psalms chapter 89, I will read to you just a couple of short verses of scripture. Psalm 89, 20. I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him. And Jesus said in St. John 10, and ten, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This pandemic has brought the church into areas we have never been before. We are experiencing issues and situations that we never dreamed about 
even at the turn of the century or the turn of the year. I would tell you today that basic human nature remains the same even in the midst of time of crisis. And there are so many reasons why the church really needs to remain strong in this moment of time. This is not a time for a weakening church. This is not a time for a church to grow lethargic and complacent and develop an attitude that really indicates a lack of interest in the things of God and of the Spirit. I think that is exactly what Satan would love to have happen. But God has planted us in this world for such a time as this. The church is alive and well. The church is still empowered, not by might, nor yet by power, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. Hallelujah. We are a Holy Ghost church. We are a Spirit-filled body of believers. We have not come together and compiled a group of some type of rules or regulations, but we have the Word of God that without fail gives us direction and light in a time that we really need to be directed by the Lord. But don't make a mistake about it. There are predators among our society that would not weep nor feel chagrined if the church were to disappear off of the scene. That's why we need to shout a little more and preach a little longer and sing a little louder. We need to let God have His way in our lives like never before because the church is what Christ died for. Right. That's what He's coming back for. He's not coming back for buildings and stained glasses and carpets and parking lots. He's coming back for a living body of believers that are Spirit-filled, hallelujah, that have been to an altar and experienced a resurrection experience in their own lives. I said that there were predators in our society. These are those who would thrive and would spend their time trying to take advantage of people who feel particularly under attack, particularly weakened, and to borrow a term from the events of today, people who especially feel isolated. It's not an easy process for a church that has gathered together for 60, 70 years to suddenly be relegated to a number less than 10 so that we can put together a video for you to worship by and sit in your living room on a Sunday morning. We have gone from a sizable number to 10 or less. But I want to tell you that the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is coming back not for 10, not for 5 or 6 or 7. He's coming back for a church without number that cannot be numbered because they have been purchased by His precious blood. And friend, I'd love for you to be part of this church. I'd love for you to be part of that blood-bought throng that calls Him Lord and allows Him to have complete sway in your life. I'd love for you to be one of those that stand up and proclaims to whoever will listen, Jesus 
is Lord. Oh, when you make Him Lord of your life, you're making a declaration that He alone has the preeminence and the power and the authority in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. He would have you to fall behind the body of Christ. He being the predator. The predator that wants to devour you. I read it in John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm sure that most of you have viewed some of the documentaries from Africa and foreign countries where wildlife is out on the prairies, out on the open spaces, and you've seen predators stalking herds of zebras, herds of wild beasts. And they pick out the one that is vulnerable, the one that may be wounded, the one that may be weak or just so young that it can hardly keep up by walking. The predator would love to pull down anything that is weak and vulnerable. Jesus told Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have thee that he may sift you as wheat. I want this city, this church, everyone that's viewing this video to know that these are sifting times. You cannot go through this pandemic and say, ah, doesn't bother me. My friend, your life will never be the same as it was because this pandemic has changed everything. But Jesus Christ remains the same right. yesterday and today right. and forever. And He's coming back for a people that are looking for Him. We've got to be wary We've got to be alert. We've got to be wise to the tricks of the predator. Paul told the church at Corinth, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, follow me a moment as I talk about the predator. And I talk about the predator in a manner that you can identify him with some of the events of the society in which we live in. But also, if you read your Bible, you'll know that Satan is the predator that is chiefest of all predators. It seems that the predator offers enticements. He'll come to a small child or he will come to some person that seems to be particularly vulnerable. And he will offer them something that might please them. To a child, the predator has been known to say, I'll give you some candy. And they will entice the child into entrapment and events that are so improper and are so hurtful by something that the child normally would think would be pleasant. How about the predator that comes against us spiritually? He says, I'll give you unforgiveness. You don't have to tell him you're sorry. I'll give you complacency. I'll give you some pornography. I'll give you some really good things. Good drugs. You know, they really make you feel good. And then behind his hand, he says, they might kill you, but you don't have to know about that. The predator can say, I can introduce you to some really wild friends. You should meet them. They're really neat. He could say, I can give you some times of unfaithfulness, some immorality, you can really have some fun. Let yourself go. Don't be so strict. 
Maybe He offers you unrestricted anger. Or go ahead. Man, just let her boil. Let them feel the heat of your passion. Let them feel the anger. Or maybe jealousy. How about bitterness? Bitterness goes so deep into the soul it destroys the very inward parts of any person, be they spiritual or not spiritual. Bitterness destroys. Before you know it, your freedom is gone. You're alone. You feel like you simply can't talk to anybody. At best, you feel used and abused. Before you know it, you are something that has been cast aside. Experts say there is a lie that a predator will use to break down a young victim so that they will lose their will to escape. Here it is. The predator convinces the child that their parents have moved on. That they never really loved them. That they really never cared for them and if they did, they no longer care. The devil wants you to believe that God has moved on. That God doesn't care about you. That's been too long for you to be part of a church and not know that Jesus loves you. That greater love hath no man that he would lay down his life for a friend. Somebody said that they asked Jesus how much he loved us and he spread open his arms in the shape of a cross and said this much. How much does Jesus love you today? This much. I want to help somebody defeat the deception. You don't belong with the devil. You belong here in the church. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not belong to the devil. Jesus is the one that will leave the ninety and nine to find the one lost sheep. Jesus is the one that will search through the whole house to find the one lost coin. Jesus is the one that looks for a lost child longingly looking down a lone, lonely road until the son or the daughter comes home having the evidences of a pig pen about them but they've come home anyhow and they have found the Father and He loves them. That's why the Scripture says joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. The prodigal son, he came home very reluctant to face his father, not willing to even allow his father to call him son. He said, just let me be one of your servants. I don't deserve to be your son any longer. I really blew it. But the father said to his servants, you go bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry it's party time because my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and he is found and they began to be merry the other words that we could use is that the father said son you belong here your home there's grace in the church the world needs to understand that. It's not that Jesus Christ looks over the top of sin and says, I ah, don't worry about it. No, no, He died to cleanse you from all your sins. He took your sins upon Himself so that you wouldn't have to bear any of your sin to, to heaven and to your heavenly home. 
Romans 5.20 says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And verse 8, God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's one of the most awesome scriptures in the Bible for me. While I was yet a sinner, He went to Calvary for me. While I was totally undone, He came to me and said, let me help you put your life back together. Sin has a way of separating us and isolating us. Sin will make you say, I don't fit in here. I can't go there because of what I've done. I can't go there because of what they have done. But grace says, I can go back because of what Jesus has done. He died at Calvary and I belong in the church. Amen. God has a way of saying, you belong here. The Weymouth translation of the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, We are to tell how God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not charging men's transgressions to their account, and that He has entrusted to us the message of this reconciliation. On Christ's behalf, therefore, we come as ambassadors, God, as it were, making entreaty through our lips. We, on Christ's behalf, beseech men to be reconciled to God. That's why we're having this Sunday morning service via video recording. Because we want you to come back to Christ. We can't reach out and touch you. We dare not do that. We, do our, we are practicing social distancing and we are attempting to observe the governmental regulations that are fit and proper for this moment. But I want to tell you that by the means of this video broadcast, we're reaching out to you, my friend. We're reaching out to touch your heart and touch your life. He made... God has made Him who knew nothing of sins to become sin for us in order that in Him we may become the righteousness of God. And the New Living Translation says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. I stand here today having been pastor at Calvary Tabernacle for almost 34 years. And I stand here today without embarrassment and without any hesitation to tell you you belong here. You need to come back to Christ. You need to come back to the church. It's in the presence of God that you will find all that you have been hoping to find out there in the world. But this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'm going going to heaven when I die. I'm going to heaven in the sweet by and by. You belong here. It's possible to sit in a church service and still be lost. That's when Christ finds us. When we're sitting on the back pew. When we're coming in late. Acting disinterested. Having no real evidence that anything in the Spirit is happening within us. But that's when God says, let me pour my Spirit out upon you. We sang it in our worship today. That's when the Holy Ghost will breathe on you. That's when the fire of God will fall upon you. Oh, my friend, without shame or apology today, I want to tell you, I've spent time in prayer this week about this very moment when I'm making an appeal to you. You belong here. You don't believe. You don't belong outside the church. You belong here. In our text, God reminded us, us that this is where we belong. That's why it's not enough 
And I say this with all awareness of the difficulty of social distancing and restrictions for assembling in only in small groups less than 10. I want to tell you, it's not enough to be in the building. We must be in His presence. We must have His anointing in prayer. More than once this week, I've held my wife's hand and prayed, Oh God, let Your sweet presence be upon us this week. And friend, when you allow the presence of God to touch you, it, life will have a different meaning and it will have a better purpose than you ever dreamed possible. Let's look again at what God did for David. In our text, the Scripture says, I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. It's not that the Lord didn't know where we were. But if you're not interested in God, it will not be easy for Him to say, I have found you. Because the word found there has a connotation of I have changed Him. I was without Christ. I was away from Christ. He searched for me. And when He changed my life, it became a reality that He found me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. There's much to be said about the anointing. This is what is most significant for us today. You think about it. When the time was appropriate for Samuel to anoint a king for Israel, he went to the house of Jesse. Samuel said to Jesse, Bring your sons that I may anoint one of them as king. And here they came. It's interesting to note that Jesse, the father, brought first of all the eldest, Eliab. And then he brought Aminadab. And then Shammah. And he kept bringing sons of Jesse until seven of those sons had passed before Samuel. And each one of them, God said no. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any more sons? And Jesse said, yes, I have one more. His name is David, but he's just a lad and he's tending the sheep. I'd like to just remind us that it was Jesse that put David in the sheepfold. It was Jesse that told David, you don't really belong here today because you're just a lad. You're just a young boy. I have Eliab, Aminadab, Shammah, and four other sons that might be chosen king, but not you. You go take care of the sheep. But oh, my friend, God wants to bring you in so that He can anoint you. God wants to bring you into His care and into His presence so that He can pour out His blessing of anointing and favor upon your life and put you over those things that need to be charged by a king. God's looking for someone to anoint. God's looking for someone that's capable of fighting battles that eventually will affect the entire host of Israel. Before David was anointed by Samuel, David was not ready to fight Goliath. But when Samuel anointed David, David and all of this pa happened in, over a passage of time. David got to the place where he was ready to do battle against a giant. David was sent by his father to the battlefield to see how that the Israelites were faring against the Philistines. And as 
David came into the camp, his brother, his eldest brother Eliab said, what are you doing here? You should be out tending those sheep. I know why you're here. You've come to spy on us to see how the battle is going. The whole scenario smacks of jealousy on Eliab's part. But in reality, David was there because he had been anointed. And he heard the cry of the giant. And his answer to that was, is there not a cause? I want you to know something. That when you are in the church, God's going to call you out one day and remind you that you're in the church for a purpose. That's why you belong here. That's why you need to be here. So that God can use you. So that God can send you forth. There are giants to be fought. David's own brothers said, you don't belong here. You're only here to spy on us. The suggestion, if you will, was this. David, you're so young, you are here just on a lark. You're here for personal entertainment. But I want to tell you that there are young people that are standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ in this Calvary Pentecostal tabernacle and they are not just playing games. They're not playing church, but they are filled with power and filled with anointing and they are moved mightily by the Holy Ghost because they realize that there's a place for them in God's kingdom and in God's church. You've already killed a bear. You've already killed the lion. Now, David, you belong here. There's a predator in your neighborhood. That predator would love to bring you down in defeat. But the Bible tells us, be sober, be, vil be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You didn't stay with the group. So the enemy tricked you, and he's convinced you as a result that you don't belong here. But the devil is a liar. Pastor, how will I know he's a liar? easy. If his lips are moving, he's lying. He does not know the truth. The truth is not in him. He wants your soul. But I would ask you, what will you give in exchange for your soul? You just need a new anointing because you've forgotten what it's like to be free we are not free to do as we will without restriction and discipline and guidance. But in the Holy Ghost, we are free from the bondage of sin. We are free from the curse of sin. We are free from the stain of sin. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. David's self-image could have been shattered by the rejection of his own family. When he lay at night on his bed, he could have had rolling over in his mind, David, you don't belong here, not in this family. Even after God called him, he could have been destroyed by Saul, King Saul's hatred for him. As he lay at night hiding in the cave of Adullam trying to escape from the murderous attempts by Saul to bring him down. David no doubt thought, you don't belong here. Man, you're out of your league. You don't belong here. David's own sin of adultery with Bathsheba could have convinced him that you don't belong here. 
David, you better just quit. You better just give it up. I don't have the name of the songwriter, but the song says, Old Satan, he would love to see me fall. Oh, he loves it when my back's against the wall. But when it seems I'm about to slip again, Jesus reaches out his hand. No, I've got no reason to quit. Well, I, I've got no reason to quit. But 100 reasons why I should go on. Well, I get low and sometimes fail. And I'm not proud of it. Oh, but I've got no reason to quit. Well, there have been times the dollars were so few. And I prayed, oh Lord, what am I going to do? Then he'd say, child, why do you fret? You know I've never failed you yet. No, I've got no reason to quit. I've got no reason to quit. Hallelujah. David's family failed him, his father and his brothers. Leadership failed him, King Saul. He failed himself, but the anointing didn't fail him. He was anointed by Samuel, anointed to serve in the work of the Lord. It was part of his mindset that I'm not going to quit. This is where I belong. My friend, I look to you today to hear me when I tell you, you've got no reason to quit. You hold on to Christ. You keep on serving the Lord. You keep on believing that the church is where you belong. Make your way back to this church. As soon as the doors are open, you be part of the group that's going to assemble here together for fellowship and for preaching and for singing and for worshiping. I know you can make it because you belong here. That's why God anointed you with His Holy Spirit. This is where you belong. Why don't you write where you are if it's proper if you're not behind the wheel of a car why don't you just pray with me right now lift up your voice let your voice out lift up your hands cry aloud to God let him hear your voice call on the Lord and he will answer you when you have prayed when you have given your heart in complete uh, experience once again to the Lord without reservation Call me at the number at the bottom of this screen. Call me. Send me an email. The email and the telephone number are listed at the bottom of this screen. We can help you. We can offer you free home Bible studies. Help you get your life on track. If you need to be baptized, I can expedite that for you. I can arrange it for you. But I would tell you, my friend, right now, you belong here. You belong in the church. You have no reason to quit. Though this pandemic is making life miserable for so many, I want to tell you that the church is the place where you belong. And to call on the name of Jesus Christ, for His name is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth into it and are saved. Let us pray. Father, I pray today that as the word has gone forth, that it would reach down into the crevices and the inner parts of the souls that have heard this word. Lord, draw them. Get a good grasp on their spirit and bring them unto you. Bring them close. Cause them to see once again that this is where their hope lies for eternal life. I pray in Jesus' name, don't let any despair, but let them find in you that there is hope and that there is help in this time of need. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.